Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Woodwork for Humans, the series where even beginners can learn the fine art of joinery. And we've been doing this by focusing on simple, sturdy joints like the rabbit and the dado. Hmm? And what's great about these joints is that you can cut the sides with a nice saw and then take all the waste out just with a simple chisel. They're very easy to cut. But once you've got that waste out of the middle, well, you might have some trouble with the bottom of the joint. It might be tough to get it smooth or even or to get it to the exact depth that you want, just freehanding it with a chisel cut. Well, what do traditional woodworkers do when they run up against this problem? Well, they grab the router plane. Here is the metallic Stanley version, and it is an amazing tool. I love it. You can see it's got a flat bottom and a pair of handles, and then the cutter sticks out right here. You can set it to any depth you want, and you set it so that the sides ride on the top of your joint. And this cutter comes right in the bottom, and you can just clean up that joint, adjust the depth, make it dead flat and perfect. It's a high precision tool problem with these is that new ones are quite expensive and vintage ones like this are also quite expensive. It's just hard to find a good affordable router plane. But you know a metal factory made tool like this, this is actually a pretty modern invention. Woodworkers must have had something before this tool existed. And they did. This is the really old school version of the router plane. And you can see it's, it's really the same idea. So it's a block of wood with a cutter coming through it and the cutter sticks out the mouth down here. It's flat on the bottom so it'll sit on either side of your joint and then you just work it back and forth to clean up and straighten the bottom of your rabbits and dados. It's really kind of a brilliant solution to the problem of fixing up your joinery. You can buy one of these, and they're not super expensive on eBay. You have to deal with condition issues. Eh, it's kind of a gamble sometimes. I think what's a better idea is we should just make one. And instead of even having to find a cutter for it, we're just gonna use a garden variety bench chisel. And if you have a piece of wood and a chisel, you can make this for no money. This will be a zero cost build for a really useful specialty plane. It's perfect. There's, there's nothing not to like about this. Oh, except the name. Back in the day, uh, woodworkers, they called this the, the hag's tooth or the old woman's tooth. Ugh. It's, a little, it's a little awkward to the modern ear. It's not, it's not respectful language. I mean, seriously, woodworkers of the past, get woke. Here's the vintage tool, and you can tell there is nothing complicated going on here. This is a single block of wood with a cutter and a wedge. It goes through a mortise in the body, and the cutter comes out the mouth down here. Now, the only complicated part is the mortise right in here. Hold on a second. Okay, this mortise is not easy to cut because it's tapered, it's wide at the top and narrow at the bottom, and it's also angled. It goes in at about a 60 degree angle right here. That makes it kind of tricky, especially if you're a beginning woodworker, and that turns a simple tool into a challenging build. But don't worry, I have come up with a foolproof method that will let even a total beginner get this mortise right on the first try, even if you've never cut one before. But first, let's prep our stock. I'm using a piece of rough cherry for this build, mostly because I had it and it's big enough. This project requires a lot of layout and you need a straight and square block to begin with. This piece was really uneven and I probably spent at least a half hour planing, checking, and marking clean faces and true 90 degree edges. If you already have a square block of wood, or if you can glue up some boards into a block, that will definitely save you a lot of time. To do my layout, I'm gonna copy all the angles and dimensions directly off the original. I've covered half of the tool in blue painter's tape. This is gonna allow me to draw measurements and layout lines right on the tool, and then just peel them off later without hurting anything. To transfer my measurements onto my stock, I'm going to use this little Craig measuring jig. This thing looks cheap, but I honestly use it all the time, and it's a good alternative to a more expensive combination square. I'll put a link to it down in the description. 
Now, I'm really taking my time marking out my mortise and my bed angles. These are the only really critical dimensions. If you want to know more about the specifics, you can grab the full set of plans or check out the free tip sheet, and I've got links to both of those down in the description. To get the width of the mortise, I suggest using the actual chisel that's going to be your blade. I'm using a half inch, 13 millimeter chisel, and I'm adding about a sixteenth of an inch to either side so I have some room for lateral adjustment. Now, if we were going to cut this mortise the traditional way, we would just grab a chisel and start chopping. If you are an advanced enough woodworker and you feel comfortable doing that, go for it. But if you're more of a beginner, I've got a foolproof method that's still going to give you excellent results. I'm going to take the front of my mortise, strike a knife line across it, and then carry that line all the way around the stock, using the angle at the front of my mortise to draw the lines down the sides. I'm basically taking the front half of the plane in line with my mortise, cutting it off, and taking it away. And that's going to give me access to the inside of the mortise. It's going to make it really easy to cut and pair the bed until it's perfect, and then I'll just laminate the plane back together again. Once I've cut my knife line all around, I'll use a chisel to make a knife wall that's going to guide my saw. I'll start at the corners with my Dazuki saw, and then slowly pull those cuts across my knife lines, around the edges, and over the faces of the stock. I don't have to cut very deeply here. The point is just to create a kerf that will guide my saw later and ensure a perfect cut. Once I have a really accurate kerf all around my stock, I'll switch to my Rayoba with its aggressive rip teeth. This cut is easy because I've created a path for the saw to follow. It took a minute to set up, but now it's almost impossible for my cut to drift off course, and it only takes a minute for me to slice my whole block cleanly in half. The faces of my cut need a little cleanup, and you can plane those, or just put a piece of sandpaper on your bench and sand them flat. Both approaches work fine. Now I have full access to the inside of my plane, and it's easy to mark out the exact location of my mortise. Instead of chiseling the whole thing out slowly, I can quickly cut accurate sides with my Dazuki saw and then chisel out the waist. You can see here that I also sawed another kerf right down the middle of the waist, and that's making it extra easy to clean out the bulk of the material. Here you can see me using my new joiner's mallet that I made just a couple of weeks ago. It's patterned after an amazing vintage mallet, and I've got a video and plans if you'd like to make your own. With the waist removed, I'm using a controlled two-handed grip to carefully pair my bed flat and straight. Cutting the plane in half definitely adds a little bit of time to this build, but you'd be amazed at how quickly you can cut this mortise when you have access to three sides. Even if you've never done a mortise before, this technique makes it a snap, and we're ready to glue this plane back together. Now, I do a lot of glue-ups on this old melamine shelf. You can grab these anytime someone throws out a piece of IKEA furniture. They're very flat, and glue won't stick to melamine. Now, big, flat surfaces like this tend to slide around during glue-up. It can really mess up the alignment of your parts, so I sprinkle on a couple grains of salt and use a three-clamp setup. One clamp from the top will keep the front piece from sliding up, and a clamp on each end will bring the seam tightly together. Those salt crystals will dissolve into the glue and just disappear as the whole thing dries. While the glue is drying, you can make your wedge. I'm cutting mine from a cherry board. For the curves on top, you can draw them freehand, and obviously I have clear drawings of this in the plans. The wedge itself needs an 8 degree angle. I've done this many times, and I find it's helpful to make your wedge thicker and longer than you think you need. That way, even if you have to do a lot of planing and trimming to get a good fit, you still have enough material when it's all over. Cutting the details for your wedge is easy. Saw the straight lines and chisel the curves, or saw them out with a coping saw. The tricky part is getting a good fit with your plane. The handle of your chisel is definitely going to interfere with the back of your wedge, and you'll need to scoop out some material there. Once the chisel and the wedge are working together, tap on the back of your chisel and see if it will come out the mouth. Mine won't, but that's a good thing. My wedge is oversized, and I've got lots of wiggle room for slowly adjusting the fit until the blade will come out the bottom. Once you have a little bit of blade sticking out, Stop and test the tool. I've made a little test dado in this block, and it has a very rough bottom. Even though my little plane is only half done, it makes cross-grain shavings easily and quickly cleans up the bottom of this joint. 
The tool works, and I can move on to shaping. So now my tool works, but it's much too big and blocky. It's very difficult to grip. One of the things that's great about the Vintage Tool is it actually has amazing ergonomics. These curves make it super easy to grab and hold on to, and it's comfortable. You can use it for a long time. I want to duplicate as much of this curvature as I can, but I think the original maker probably used some specialty tools for these really deep cuts. This looks to me like he probably used a molding plane or maybe a large gouge to get this really long perfect curve on the front and the back. Some of these were made out of scraps of pre-made railing, but this one wasn't. It's not symmetrical and the profile's all wrong. The craftsman actually cut these details. Now, I've done videos before about cutting curves with flat hand tools, and we could duplicate this shape, but honestly, I think it's too much trouble. I think it's a much better idea to just use a slightly modified design that's going to get us the same results. First, I need the top of the plane to be much narrower for a good grip. So here, on the end of my piece, I've laid out the material I want to get rid of. I'll use my Ryoba to make two intersecting cuts that remove a big chunk of wood. Then I'll come in with my plane and add some roundovers on that top edge. This is already a huge improvement, and the tool feels pretty comfortable. I also want to clean up and refine the surfaces left by the sawing, and this would be difficult, except I recently made a rabbit plane that's capable of getting right up to the edges of things. I'm using it without the fence, and I can get right into the corner of these cuts for a smooth surface and a crisp inside edge. I'll also use a chisel and a sanding block to refine some other sharp edges and torn fibers. Once you've got your plane into a state where it's easy to grip, that's most of it. But you might also want to cut away some corners here to keep them from being fragile or tough on the hand. And you also might see this throat that's been cut out in the front. This makes it much easier to look down the front of the plane and actually see what you're cutting. These details are very easy to cut in our plane. I'm just going to lay them out using a random round object from the shop, and then I will cut them out with a coping saw. Then I'll come in with a sanding stick to fair out those curves, and a piece of sandpaper wrapped around a dowel will help me clean out that mouth that I just made. Now, this is a wooden plane, and these are typically adjusted with hammer strikes. Hold on just a second. So, with the original plane set up like this, if you want more iron, you just take a hammer and tap the iron. And then if you want less iron, you tap on the face of the tool. And that brings it out so that you can adjust it and put it back together again. The only problem with this is that tapping on the top of the plane like this does damage the plane. This vintage one has a lot of hammer marks here, and it's starting to get a little bit chewed up. The cherry that I use to make my plane is a little bit on the soft side, and I'm concerned that constantly hammering on the top of it is going to beat up this tool really quickly. So, I've got a solution to that. Here's the finish tool, and what I've just done is I've installed a strike button over here. And it's just a carriage bolt that I've glued in. Uh, carriage bolts have this little square section underneath the head, so after I've drilled a hole, I also need to chisel out a little square where that's going to fit, and then it's just a little bit of five-minute epoxy and drop this in. And once you have a strike button like this, then adjusting the plane becomes easy and you really can't damage it. If you want more iron, you just tap the back of the chisel, no big deal, and if you need to get the iron out, just give that strike button one or two good whacks and everything comes right out and you can reset your depth. Once you have a strike button, you can really hit the plane as often as you want, as hard as you want, with a metal hammer and you're not going to damage it. It's a detail that you see on a lot of vintage planes because it makes them last longer and that's great for everybody. With the construction complete, I sanded the whole thing with 220 grit and I'm going to apply boiled linseed oil and paste wax to the body of the plane but I'm going to leave the inside mortise totally bare and not put any wax on the wedge. These parts rely on friction to work, and adding a lubricant like wax will only hurt the plane's performance. A little bit of oil on the outside of the wedge won't be a problem once it soaks in. Now that the plane is finished, let's learn how to set it accurately. I've made another test dado. If I just want to smooth out the bottom, it's easy enough to tap the iron until you can feel it just taking a light cut. Then you can work your way most of the way in from one side, cleaning and leveling the bottom as you go. To avoid blowout on the far side, flip the piece in the vise and finish the last bit from the opposite direction. 
Another thing we might want to do is make our dado deeper by just a bit. You can get a really accurate depth setting from this tool by taking a piece of heavy paper like a note card and cutting it in half. Put a piece of paper under each side of the plane and then tap the iron down until it's just barely touching the surface of the wood. Then take out your paper spacers and start cutting. I've used thick paper here and this is about the heaviest cut the tool can take so I angle it a bit to skew the iron and make the cut easier and leave a cleaner surface. You can see when I'm done, the joint has a flat and even bottom and very crisp edges. I can slide in a shelf or another component and this joint is going to work perfectly. So here's the finished plane and you can see it looks a lot like the original. They're really similar. I made mine a tiny bit longer because I have big hands and this way I can get all of my fingers on it. That's a little bit more comfortable for me. Um, this was literally a zero cost build for me. I already had the chisel sitting around and then just a block of cherry. And now I have a tool that's really almost as good as the modern metal tool for no money. Uh, if you'd like to make a tool like this, I have a great set of plans available at rexkruger.com store. They are always very affordable. Of course, my patrons never have to worry about how affordable plans are because they get all of my plans for free. They also get early access to videos, I write blog posts, do tool reviews, talk about books, I make exclusive content for them. I do a lot of things for my patrons because my patrons make this all possible. And I can't thank them enough. If you'd like to be part of the amazing community of craftspeople that's happening right here on this channel, go on over to patreon.com slash rexkruger and check out the rewards I have for the people who make this all happen. And I always want to end my videos by thanking my viewers. I wouldn't be here at all if people didn't watch these videos and like them and comment on them and come to the premieres and have a conversation with me. I love what I do. And you guys watching right now, you're the ones who make it possible. Thanks for watching.